in the conclusion of Ayan Bayes, I actually came back to the pages in Ayan Bayes as we've been learning also the background material, the source material. In the Mithla Rebbe's Mimer, and prior to that, the Alter Rebbe's Mimer, Mika Hashem Elekeinu. So in the last class, which was a week ago, um, we learned page 1474 in Ayin Beis, the paragraph, the middle paragraph, which is based on the exact, the bottom of page 381 and uh, 382 in the Mitla Rebbe's Maimon, if you're following along the exact uh, parallels. So let me sum up what we've been learning and where we're going and the, the whole uh, bigger picture here. So keep in mind that the Rebbe Rashab never finished, obviously did not have the time to finish Ham Shechayim Beis completely. And we know that because you could see that some of the questions he asked some of the themes he began to discuss earlier don't have a conclusion. However, the good news is that we have the, the foundational texts upon which the Rebbe Rasha built this Hemshech, especially the end of the Hemshech. And namely, that's the Mimer called Mika Hashem Alekeinu, HaMagbi Lesheves, and HaMashpili Lires. It's a Mimer, Hanukkah Mimer, that the Alter Rebbe delivered Hanukkah Tov Kuf Samach uh, Vov, and it is printed in Torah Eir, and we learned that whole Mimer with an explanation of the Mimer. And then there's the Mittler Rebbe's elaboration of that Mimer that the Mittler Rebbe, 20 years later, delivered also a Mimer Hanukkah based on the Alter Rebbe's Mimer, and it's published in Maimori Ad Muram Tsoi, which we've been learning Beginning on page 361, Breshis. So also a Hanukkah Mimer and the Sefer Breshis, Mamorad Muram Tsoi, page 361. Just giving some of the background in case some people are interested in that, but I you know, like to be thorough. So, therefore, when we look there, you could see the themes and the questions that the Rebbe Rashab asked and began to discuss in Ayin Bayes that he never concluded. There they are concluded. There he does f tie it all up. So that's one of the reasons we felt, I felt that it would be good to learn those memoriam inside. Because with that, we can get the picture of what Ayan Bayes would have most, uh, most likely looked like, even though we don't know exactly what the Rebbe Rashab would have chosen and written and what would he have added and so on. But at least we don't not left in the middle of a topic that it does come to a conclusion. And it also helps illuminate, in general, the themes, as well as in, also to see the fascinating, the way the Aksidus evolves and develops from the Alter Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe, to the Rebbe Rashab. I should add that Semach Tzedek also has a mimer like this, that he said in Tafrish Tazvav, which I will refer to a little later when we finish up, because um, he actually speaks about it in somewhat different language, but the same themes, and you can also derive certain points there. But right now, not to overwhelm us, let's just focus on the Mitla Rebbe, which follows the Alter Rebbe and the Rebbe Rashab. So what is the theme? What are the themes that are being addressed here? <laughs> so last Sunday, I gave a pretty thorough overview, which I don't want to do again now because it's all recorded. Um, and therefore can be accessed by anyone at uh, ironbase.com is the website where we have all these the, the videos and the YouTube channel as well on the, of these Ironbase classes. But I will say a few key points just to keep the con keep everything into con in context. The Ironbase is structured around the concept of interface with Kesser being the operative word for interface, interface between the divine and existence. So really, it's a central theme of Chassidus in general, but Ayin Beis captures it in a very comprehensive way, bringing from many Maimorim, 
And the Rebbe Rashab, in his most inimitable and uh, brilliant fashion, ties it all together into this magnum opus called Ayim Beis. Now, the key thing to keep in mind with the interface is that you're interfacing between two entities, in this case, Elokus and Velt, godliness, the divine and existence, or transcendence and immanence, meaning the divine as it relates to existence and the divine that's beyond existence, is to know that this can be done in two fat ways, from the top down or from the bottom up. Or let's go the other way, order, from the bottom up or from the top down. This is also very central to Chassidus. Um, even in the Maimorim, for example, in Bosilagani, he talks about Lamai Lamai Laden Ketz, Lamata Mata Aden Tachlis, also talks about from the top down and from the bottom up. In general, that's the two approaches in the Aveda of Tfila and Teda. Tfila is in general like a sulam, a ladder that begins from below, that stands on the ground, and it's the heart and soul of the one that's praying, that's reaching upward. Teda is a gift, Matan Teda, that gave Hashem gave us his Teda to us. So in general terms, that's the difference between a matla ma'adid. In Aveda, that's a matla ma'ala ma'ala ma'ala. There's plenty of overlap. There's pl- in Teda, you'll have Mamat Lamayla, and, and in Tfili, you'll have Mamat Lamat as well. But in general terms, these are the two ways of connecting the two realities. And mitzvahs, which we, you can say is Gemilas Chasadim, Teda, Avedi, Gemilas Chasadim, the three pillars upon which the world stands. Mitzvahs, as we have learned and we will learn in Teda, especially and in Mitla Rebbe's Maimer, is like a combination of Mamat Lamayla, Mamat Lamata. Because on one hand, the mitzvah is taking Gashmizdik world and transforming it into a mitzvah. On the other hand, the mitzvah was given to us from above. God gave us this mitzvah. Where tefillah, even though it's also a mitzvah, and it's also in Teda, but tefillah is really a person requesting his needs, coming from our, uh, taking our, our initiative. But regardless, you have these three things, and we'll talk about that more later as well. For now, Tfila and Teira are the main two. So Tfila was talked about, Mamat I should say, in the, almost 550 pages from the middle of volume two to the middle, middle, middle of volume three, concluding on page 1349. And 1350, until the end of the Hemshech, which, as I said, doesn't really end, he's talking about Teira and This is a very important thing to keep in mind. In understanding Teirah and Matla Maila, that's where he brought in the, the, the Maimer that we're learning now. The Maimer of Ner Mitzvah V'Teirah Er and Ner Hashem Nishma Sodom. The difference between that both a, a soul and a mitzvah are called Ner, a candle, and Teirah is called Er, light. So on page 1350, the Rebbe Rasha began to explain that the three elements of a flame is the wick, the oil and the fire and light that creates, as he explained, in the soul, that is the soul is the divine soul is the wick. It's immersed and descends into the oil of the animal soul's wisdom, intelligence, of human intelligence, with the objective of turning that into oil and fuel that will create divine fire, divine light. A love for God which you can call like a light, a flame, a fiery passion for God, a fiery flame that is b'chol with both sides of the Yetzir, not just the Yetzir Teh, but also the Yetzir Hara, b'chol But the problem is, how does the animal soul, whose interest initially and inherently is self-interest, it's all about self, how can you transform that? So this is the central theme of the Maimer in Teirah Er, the Mitla Rebbe's Maimer, the Alter Rebbe's Maimer, the Mitla Rebbe's Maimer, and the Rebbe Rashab is drawing from there. So the, so the, the answer briefly, as the Alter Rebbe answers, the Mitla Rebbe answers, is through work, hard work. And tefillah is one of the ways it's done. The primary way it's done. That when Neshama contemplates on godliness, in Pesukah de Zimra, and then Birch is about the angels praising God, 
that starts softening up the Nefesh Abamis, which is rooted in those angels. Then comes Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elkeinu, Hashem Achad, and Baruch Shem Kved Malchus Eloelam Vod, which is a contemplation on the Yachdus Hashem, how God is truly one with everything, including the animal soul, including the physical world. It's all part of a higher divine unity. When that is done properly, that will ultimately affect the animal soul and sublimate, tame it, and harness it to become oil, fuel, for the divine soul's wick to, to, in that passion of Ahavta Hashem Elekecha B'chol Levofcha B'shnei Yitzarech. Now, how that's done is the, is, the, is the elaboration to understand what the contemplation consists of, which I'm going to go over in a moment. Now, the Rebbe Rashab, for the record, never gets back to the answer of how it affects the animal soul. He only talks about the contemplation. But the Alter Rebbe and the Mitla Rebbe, more at length, they then take that contemplation on the Shema and Baruch Shem and bring it to the conclusion. So you can derive from those Maimarim what the answer is. And it's very clear that's the answer. Again, we can only speculate. We don't know how the Rebbe Rashab would have phrased it, would he have framed it a bit differently, would he explain it more. He definitely would go in that uh, kav in that direction because we see that's the whole flow of the Maimorim are following the themes in this Hanukkah Maimorim that I'm Miyakasha Malakenu. But again, we cannot know exactly what he's written, what he's written. But we know can know enough to understand what the conclusion would have been and what the answer is to these questions. So now let's talk more about the contemplation itself. And there uh, we've learned it, as I said, in Teir Eir. Mitla Rebbe is more at length. And now we're learning it in Ayin Beis. Once we've learned it in Mitla Rebbe, we went back to the Ayin Beis to learn it in the Ayin Beis. So this, I would sum it up as four key points in the contemplation that the Shema and Baruch Shem that allows, the, that will ultimately impact a person's Nefesh Abam, its animal soul as well, to rethink its ways, if you wish, and appreciate what godliness is, and learn to love God. So the contemplation begins with, firstly, the concept of yesh ma'ayin. That creation all begins yesh ma'ayin. To understand Hashem achod, unity, you have to understand that we are not equals to God. There's no two entities here. There's only one reality. And existence was created by that reality. And existence has nothing in common with God, and does not affect Him. And I elaborated how, import, how important that is on understanding true bitla and yichud. That was point number one. Point number two, in order to create the yesh in a way that it should exist, being that God is completely beyond it, he did it through an eye through oir. Oir does not affect the source, and even the oir is not affected by the creation. This oil itself has two, sta- has two stages. The ayin of the yesh amiti, that's the oil itself God chose to express himself, to reveal himself. And the second is the ayin of the yesh anivra, which is another stage that is a, a lakus as it relates and engages with existence. Like the asara my moris, nivra elam. God says, yehi oil. But before that, there's general oil. To these, since this is a paradigm shift from one level of I into the next, so there's a there's a parsa, a symptom, and a parsa between them, a partition that allows to make that create that shift from the divine beyond existence and the divine that relates to existence. So that's three points so far. And the fourth point is that the Abishtar is not bound by that parsa. That's all for us to exist. We need to have these stages. Stauschlus. But Kale Dea Savai, the Abishta includes both those, both, both of them as one. These two perspectives of the Ayn of the Eshamiti, which sees existence through the bird's eye view of God, which is that nothing exists, it's only godliness. Like he said, Bitl Mitsias, Das Elyon. The second level of Ayn is Das Tachtan. That's already godliness as seen through the prism of existence. So that's Bitla Yesh, because there is an existence, but it's sublimated and subjugated to godliness from the point of view of Atmos, 
Kel de Savaya, both of them are one. Yehud de Tata, Yehud de La, Yehud de La, Yehud de Tata are like one. Because there's no parsa, there's nothing in between. And both of them, even the very parsa itself, the concealment, from God's point of view, it's not a concealment, it's just another power of His. Like He said, the language we learned last week, we learned it a few times already. He said, um, Why? Because it's a kayach ha'ensav, kayach ha'gili. The kayach to conceal is a divine power, just as the power to reveal. So from that perspective, even das ta'achten, even the divine that relates to existence is really completely bottle like das alien of Yehud Eilah. As we learned, and the point that he's leading to is that the more we can understand and appreciate this and integrate it, the more the animal soul will ultimately be affected and transformed. As we read it, remember I, I went back to the Maimer and Peter Air where he said it ex explicitly. Um, <clears throat> but we will learn this more in the Mitla Rebbe's mind. Okay. And this is Ani Rishen Vani Achlin. Ani Rishen Ani Achlin. I am the first. The I in Ani is the letters I in. The I in of the Eshemiti is one. The I in of Kes is one with the I in Achlin of Malchus that goes into existence. Everything. Beshavaru Atakani Ani Hu. And his name shoved in the front of his body. I call me Yuchad Batsmusi his body. And that means me below that ain't a lekim, because before him in his presence there's no concealment. So kamoi imkain kamoi sha ayin al me Yuchad Batsmusi kamoi kena ayin beis me Yuchad the bottle betachlis. So if you were to say that the second ayin is not united and not as as nullified as the first ayin, so you could say the divine that relates to existence is existence has some uh, diff, uh, existence still has some some uh, smokim, some value. But if you say in truth it's completely bottled, just like the higher level, that it tells you that all of existence, even as it is in the lower levels, is only really godliness. So Yeshma Ayin is not just the Ayin, in other words, that the, the godliness that's beyond existence, everything is nullified in that presence. But even as the divine comes into existence, like we learned with the Mitla Rebbe at length, even when it manifests within existence, it really is completely beyond. Like he said, it's defi it defines existence, but is not defined by existence. It contains existence, but is not contained by existence, as we learned at length. And that's what we are up to. So the bottom of page 1474 in Ayin Bays. And again, that corresponds to the pages 381 and 382 in the Mitla Rebbe's Maimorim. So unless somebody has any questions, I'm ready to continue learning on. And as I said, my goal is to learn a few more. It's one, we have two, three pages approximately till the end of Ayin Bays. And then go back to the Mitla Rebbe and see how the Mitla Rebbe would ca continues on the theme with the Rebbe Rashab, as I said, stops. Okay. Are there any questions? I have a question. Um... So, in a way, you say we can extrapolate what the Rebbe Rashab might have answered by going back to uh, at the end, the conclusion of Ayin Base by looking at the Alter Rebbe's Mimer and the Ritler Rebbe's Mimer. My right. question to you is: Throughout Ayin Base, the fourteen hundred and seventy pages, there were a number of Mimer uh, that the Rebbe Rashab wrote about in Ayin Base, based on other Mimer of the Alter Rebbe and the Ritler Rebbe. Is that correct? Yes. Was there ever when the Red when the Rebbe Rashab would write about it in Ayin Base. Was there ever a time when he, when he, in, instead of extrapolating or con, or continuing in the same sheet to say of the Alter Rebbe or, or the Mitla Rebbe and Mimer, took a, made him real chidush, so that 
or was it always that the the Rebbe Rashab would would be, be a hamshaka that you could clearly relate to it, or was there ever some dramatic changes that you could perceive so, in those in those memorial? Both are correct. There are times where it's closer without much additions, but there are times there were a tremendous amount of additions. The Rebbe Rashab always adds something. That I could tell you. It's never just purely. Even when he quotes, literally, there are pieces he quotes from those memoriam, which I pointed out many times. Even then, he will add explanation. Um, but there are times where, to put it, it's more dramatic than others. You don't even have to go back earlier in Ayim Bez. Even here, um, pages 1474, 1475 that we're learning right now, add very uh, dramatic additions that you're not going to find in the Mitla Rebbe and the Alter Rebbe. Mm. Obviously, when you learn it properly, once you learn the Rebbe Rashab, you see, ah, you know, it, it enriches what they wrote. But on your own, we'd never have, have understood it that way. So it's not a, never got, it's not, never, it's, it's not different, but there's plenty of embellishment and uh, an additional explanation. As a matter of fact, I pointed out, I don't know if you were in the class the last few weeks, where there where he explains these two levels of Dasen and Das Takhtan. The Rebbe Rashab explains it, where the Mitla Rebbe remains somewhat a little more abstract than Rebbe Rashab brings it, drives the point home. You're going to see now what we're going to learn today is this is a whole piece that the Rebbe Rashab completely adds that the Mitla Rebbe doesn't even mention. But you can see how the Rebbe Rashab is taking what the Mitla Rebbe says and asking question and answering, and with that, the whole topic becomes far more, uh, I, I should say, uh, more developed, more comprehensive. It's hard to measure, you know, you could understand the ideas in Torah Er even. I already pointed out how the Mithla Rebbe asked the Torah Er. You could understand, obviously, the ideas in Mithla Rebbe, but when you learn it with the Rebbe Rashab, it's a whole other dimension, even in this topic. And same as earlier in Ayim Beis, whenever the Rabbeim in general would bring from previous Rabbeim, there was always those additions. I mean, look at, let's say, the Rebbe is doing to Basil Ligani. So Basil Ligani has 20 chapters, and the Rebbe takes every year another chapter and dissects it and explains it and brings other Rabbeim and all that, how the Rabbeim explain. So it's, it's very similar. Uh, obviously, the Rebbe does it with, through his style, but it's the same idea, taking the central theme, and elaborating on it. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, but I just, one more follow-up on that. So you were you were saying that when we ended Iron Base, you know, he left unanswered questions, and then the, that you found what you thought are the probable or possible answers to those questions in the previous memoriam of the Mithla Rebbe and the Alta Rebbe. I just wanted to know you're maybe uh I, let me just correct yeah. I, I don't even think it's probable or possible it's absolute in my mind because he's actually quoting from there it's not like i found something and i'm speculating the rebbe rashab is actually quoting entire pieces from those memoriam so it's very clear that it's those memoriam i what i was saying is i don't know exactly how the altar the middle of the rebbe rashab would have written it out would he have quoted it all would he have quoted parts would he have added more but there's no, I just want to make it clear. It's not my, it's the Rebbe Rashab himself refers to those my Marim. Just for the record. Yeah. So go ahead. But the answers, but the answers are uh, also, you're saying the answers that you have found would be, that would be 100% you just said, would be the answers yeah, that the I, Rebbe Rashab. Obviously, if, if he's quoting uh, if 80% of the Mimer and he just didn't have uh -huh. a chance to write the other 20%, you don't need to uh -huh. be. You know, it's not a a, a a a a leap to say that that's the flow. But again, what he would have added and how he would have emphasized it could have been a lot more than we will ever know. But the minimum we'll have, we definitely have answers to the questions, and we definitely have a far more elaboration on the topic. Look, I pointed it out. This is not speculation at all. On page fourteen sixty six, he actually quotes literally pieces from the Alter Rebbe and the Mitla Rebbe, asks questions, then begins, as they begin, to explain it all, and 
you continue reading, you see it parallels. Mm-hmm. Mitla Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab is paralleling the Mitla Rebbe's pages with elaborations. Then he ends the Mitla Rebbe Rashab and the Mitla Rebbe continues. So it's like, to me, it's not even a, it's, it's a given. Again, I, I can't say what the Rebbe Rashab would have actually written, but it's hard for me to imagine that he would have written something else completely. Why would he? He's, he's going with that mimer, with those questions, with that explanation. We're talking about 10 pages of paralleling exactly the mimer of the Mitla Rebbe and the Alter Rebbe. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a lot you can learn from all this. Because, look, it's all available. You could sit. As I said, I'm doing my best here in this class. But if you really want to, you can sit line by line, read the Mitla Rebbe, read the Rebbe Rashab, and you'll see it. It's as it's, it's, it's clear as day that he's literally quoting, in some places, word for word. Some places, not word for word. Some places, he rewrites it. But it's the same theme. Actually, my I and Bayes, I have marked up where it's exactly the same language and where it's just the central, the general ideas are the same. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, I was going to continue now at the bottom of 1474 in I Bayes. And here, the Rebbe Rashab is a clear addition that the Mitla Rebbe does not address. But you can see here how the Rebbe Rashab understands something based on what the Mitla Rebbe says, which is based on the Alter Rebbe. The Mitla Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab is now going to explain about these two levels of ayin. Because based on what we just said, it poses a question. If you were to say that there are two levels of the divine, one is the ayin of the Yesh Amiti, which is elokus as it's beyond existence. And the second is the ayin of the Yesh Elokus as it relates to existence. Okay, so we understand why there's two levels of ayin. But now, you t- you t- we've just learned that that's only from our point of view, from Ishtashal's point of view. From God's point of view, it's all one thing. The ayin of the Yesh and the Yesh. So the Rebbe Rashab asks, he's like asking a question on the Mitla, not on the Mitla Rebbe, but how on the topic as the Mitla Rebbe explains it. And that the Rebbe Rashab just elaborated on himself. I'm reading the, the bottom paragraph on page 1474. The pages can be found at ayinbeis.com. According to this, so they're really not two levels of ayin. Only from our point of view, there's two levels of ayin, but not in truth. Everything is one level of ayin. So in, in other words, if you're saying that we are simply because the curtain, the partition, doesn't allow us to see the divine Behind the partition, that's only from our perspective. But from God's perspective, what's one level of ayin? The energy that he invested, that he created in order to create existence. But it's really one level of ayin from his point of view, one level of yichud. Everything is the ayin of the yesh because we said the ayin of the yesh is just as bottle as the ayin of the yesh so why do we say We said before, I am the first and I am the last. No, you're one. As soon as you say I'm the first, I'm the last, you're, you're, you're attributing you're giving attribution to two levels. That's how the Rebbe Rasha poses this question. And as I said, the Mitla Rebbe does not address this directly. But by explaining this, the Rebbe Rashab is going to will help us understand what the Mitla Rebbe is saying. Begam, another question. The Lefizeh, lo yeshu mishavas klal. Since it's one level of ayin and really everything is but like that, 
So there's no real Isavos. There's no Isavos at all. If you were to say there was a level of divine energy that relates to existence, and that's a true nature, so from that point of view, there's an existence. But since you're saying that the lower level that relates to existence is really one with a level that does not relate to existence, completely not existence in truth, there's no existence, so there's no Isavos at all. But doesn't it say in the Pasuk, God created the world? So in other words, to, to, to elaborate a bit on the question, if the truth is, like we, like it's a famous, I mean, if the truth is that everything is really godliness, and it's only we're blinded and we don't see it, so in a way, it's an illusion. Existence is an illusion in a way. Because in truth, it's all eloquous. We just don't see it. But we know the fact is God did create existence. And the fact is that there are two levels of ayin, adnirish and aniyachim. So how do you explain that? How do you explain both at the same time? Now, just again, to elaborate a bit more. If you were to say, for example, the divine relates to existence, you'd say, okay, our relationship with Elikus is the relationship with Asar and with the divine as it relates to us. To use a simple example, example that we've been using, a brilliant teacher is infinitely distant from his student, but he wants to have a relationship with the student. So the teacher goes to a, a student and says, I, let me share with you an idea. He doesn't give him all his ideas, he gives them a very limited amount of what he knows. And in that area, they have something in common. He's teaching them olive base. If you really look into the teacher, who the teacher is, the teacher is far beyond olive base. And by him, olive base is equal to all his brilliance. But the student doesn't know any of that. The student is just getting spoon-fed one idea at a time. Olive, base, gimel, dal, whatever it is. So that would mean that God, our relationship with, with the teacher, with God in this case, is on a limited basis. But you're saying, that's not that you're saying that in truth, that ur that's coming to the student is one with the ur that's by the teacher. So even though the student is not aware of it, but that's the true level of it. So then, is there really a student? Is there really a relationship? When in truth, it's only because the student is blinded? So how do you explain from God's point of view, from the teacher's point of view, the second level? From the student's point of view, it's not a problem because we only have a limited perspective. But if you want us to appreciate God's perspective, then it would seem that nothing exists really in truth at the end of the day. But Rabbi, you could also say that from his perspective, the world has always existed. So what does it mean that God created the world? I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like he's beyond time, so... No, no, we can't say that because the world is finite. And like he said, the world by definition doesn't have on its own any type of infinite uh, reality. But within it, Hashem, it's always existed. What, what, or the possibility... We're not talking about, talking about the world, you're talking about God. The I'm world, talking. the world, take away a divine, take away energy. It's like saying, um, you see a stone, I take a stone and I throw it. So while it's flying in the air, you could say, okay, it has my energy in it. But as soon as you take away my energy, as soon as it dissipates, the stone will fall. Existence doesn't have any value of its own because nothing can right. create itself. I understand. So, so what I'm saying is from God's perspective. Itself, one second. Since nothing can create itself, existence doesn't have any value, like we've learned at length, of its own. The only value it has because there's a creative energy within it. Like we learned, that's why it's not yesh miyesh. It's not like the creative energy of an engineer or of a scientist that sh reshapes one reality into another. We're talking about a reality that does not have anything in common with the divine, and yet God infuses it with energy. So I'm not sure what you're asking. I guess I meant from God's perspective, has the world always no, existed? No, no, absolutely not. Okay. Because, because um, it's um, it itself, right. time and space itself is a creation. 
So the concept of always. I see. <laughs> okay, that helps. Okay. Thanks. This is the whole entire idea. The way that Hashem is seeing it, there is no creation. And that's his question. It would be easier to answer if you could say that Hashem that's beyond everything has no relationship with us. That you could then say, you know what? We have a relationship only with, like I always talk about the art relates to the artist as the artist relates to the art. But the, idea, the levels of Eina Ilam Mekeme is beyond us. The thing is, however, he's saying that Shema and Yichud and Das Elyon is also part of our In other words, we also want to understand, we also need to understand it from God's point of view. That's where the problem is. In other words, to say that a person lives their entire life and their relationship with God is a very limited one, meaning limited to their needs. You know, God sustains you, gives you life. But you're not relating to the God that's beyond existence. That is why some Mekubolim take a hold. Like, remember I spoke about Mekubolim Adeshenim, that hold, that existence is like yesh miyesh. Not because God is not beyond, it's because the God that's beyond has no connection to us. He's like off limits. Like when we say, it's not our job. We don't know what's going on in the secrets of Hashem. Now you say, um, what do you say? You say, or it says, and it says, that's beyond us. So there are Jewish philosophers and thinkers that said, the areas that are beyond are just off limits. We can't go there. But Chassidus insists that God wants us to go there. He wants us to also appreciate existence from his point of view. So that's why he's asking this question. It's a very important point. He doesn't say this, but fate is share and I am based. But without it, you could always say, one second, there are two levels of iron. For us, there are two levels of iron. So by Hashem, there aren't? So fine. That's not a problem. Hashem sees everything as one, one part of godliness, and that's that. But we don't see it that way. But he wants us to access also this higher level. That's why this question looms so large. You'll see from the answer, you can understand the question even better from the answer. So let's read on. So he says like this. Acha inyan hu. The inyan of this is like this. The answer. It's not like you may think that the second level of ayin, meaning God first has the first level of ayin, let's spell out, is the field of energy that God said, I want from built to Metzius Nimtza should come an existence called Metzius Nimtza, Oyr. I've I mentioned many times, Oyr, revelation, expression, awareness. All that in Atzmus does not exist. God does not need awareness. He doesn't need consciousness. does not need consciousness. He does not need expression. He's an etzem. You know, we talk about etzem anefesh. Imagine, just, just, uh, just, just an imaginary uh, exercise. Imagine you're etzem, and you live in that world. You don't need anyone. You don't need to talk to anyone. You don't need relationships. You're completely intact and self-contained. So there's no need for ur. There's no need for shame. There's no need for expression. For what purpose? For yourself, you don't need it. For another, there is no other. So you're completely self-contained etzim. But the Abishta wanted a dira betachtenim. He desired a dira betachtenim. There's no reason for that. It's a taiva. As soon as he wants an existence of another to have a relationship with, that is the way, that how, you, how that makes sense. Obviously, he could have did kol yachal and just do whatever he wants. But he wants it to make sense to the other as well. So that's why he created a thing called Eirein Sof. Eirein Sof is essentially, it's my divine expression. I am now ready to express myself. I'm not just going to remain in my etzem self-contained. I'm going to express myself. 
and I want you to have a relationship with my expression. Not that expression will bring you back to my etzem. But the most important, so hey, that's hey, that's the ayin of the yesh amiti. The ayin of the yesh anivra goes further. To create something other, you have to define what that other is. Is it a human being? Is it chai, sameach, daimon? And what species exactly? So there, the Ebershah said, basara mamoris nivra'ela. Not just b'reshis bar alikim sashmai masaritz in general, but v'yemer alikim yihir oir. Day two yihir rakia, there should be a firmament. Day three, teitz yihir adz desha. Day four, yihir ma'oris. So now the ayin is taking shape and giving shape to existence. It's not just I want another. I, I, here is defining what that other looks like. In chapter 14 in Basilegani, in the Rebbe's explanation, 1964, Yusvari talks about this also, about the Atta Machayas Kulam, that the Atta comes into Machaya, every detail, all the way to the lowest levels. So now, here's the question. Is the ayin of the Yesha Nivra, like he says here, is, is it a Hamsha, is it a order from the ayin of the Yesha Miti? Because if it is, then comes the, the question that he asked, is a very powerful one. From God's point of view, there's no difference between the two. So the Rebbe Shab is answering and saying, the second ayin is not an extension of the first ayin. God in his initial plan, he didn't first in general, and then from there would come a second level of he initially in his plan, God in his mind wanted two levels of expression. One expression that's beyond existence and another expression that relates to existence. Which is a big chiddush because usually we think first comes a, a shapeless, seamless air, and in that air you create another air called air hagvul, the sort of memoris that, that that relates to existence. He's saying no, from the point of view of Atzmos, both of them are two expressions of the of ainsay baruchu. So it's not one. It's true that the second one emerges from the first one. But it only emerges. But they both have a root in the etzem. Ha'echad liye is b'chines ayin mamish shalamayla legame b'chines yesh. Next page, fourteen seventy five. The first of God's so called in His plan is an ayin that's completely higher than yesh. Va'abei is liye is b'chines ayin amokel yesh. And the second is that God wants an ayin that will be a amokel to the yesh. So both of them are equal because they're both coming from Atmos and they're equally united to Atmos, but they have a different personality. One's personality is just to express elokus, and the other's personality is to define and and be tailored to create a, a, a to create existence. The shneim klulim umiyuchadim ba'atmos sein sof, and both of them are encompassed and united in atzmos sein sof. It's not like the second one uh, is, is a lower level. They both are miyuchit. And it's the tzimtzum that separates the two. Without the tzimtzum, they're both united as one in Atzma's desire. He has that plan, and he wants these two energies to manifest, these two levels of ayin. So it's not two levels of ayin because from our point of view. From our point of view, there's actually two levels. One is beyond, and one relates to us. And that's where you have the question, why is there then, why are they call two levels of ayin? Because Atzmus is not two. But now that you know that Atzmus himself also wants two, he just doesn't see it the same way. We see them as very separate entities. By Atzmus, it's simply two ways of expressing himself. One is expressing himself through being higher than the yesh. One is expressing himself through relating to the yesh. And therefore, and both are united as one. So the two levels are not just simply due to our limited perspective. Even God wants two levels. So what you're seeing from here is a very, it's a very profound thought. Here's a perfect example. You asked about the Rebbe Rashab adding something. The Mitla Rebbe doesn't say anything like this at all. You, maybe if you go back to the Mitla Rebbe, you can find it hinted to. 
but he definitely does not spell it out. And the Rebbe Rashab is spelling it out because the Rebbe Rashab sees the need. Because when you read the Mitla Rebbe, you get you come back to a point in a second. If they're both one, so how do we relate to both one? I mean, we see them as two because we are limited. So in other words, it's not just that the student only gets the olive base and the other part remains beyond him. Is that the teacher who's giving the olive base is the same teacher who's te who has all the brilliance of the bleak wall because he's not closer to the infinite light than he is to the finite light or to the light that relates to the yesh, to put it in more. He's not closer to Sevam Kalam than he is to Mamal. He's not closer to the Etzema air than he is to the Hespashtus air that relates to Shaykh Le'elimus, is essentially what he's saying. But we learned this already, and I believe I elaborated then as well on this whole point. But now, once we learned it in the Mitla Rebbe, and learning it here, you can see much more, it's much more glaring the the which I say the kiddush the that he's saying here and it's I'm not suggesting that it's going to be easy to wrap your head around you may need some work on this and I'm happy to take questions because really we want to, it continues now to explain what the tzimtzum does but before we go there let's just stop here if anybody wants any clarification it's even with this explanation that. The, the the lower part is also a course it's a different channel that he chooses. But the bottom line is that the Nevoim don't see it. They don't see that this is a locus. They see that this is Nevoim, but in reality this is a locus. So he asked before, Aloy Ain Shum is Havus Klal. He didn't answer that question yet. He only answered the first question so far. You asked that question last time we learned it too, by the way. Because I still didn't get the answer. But maybe he didn't answer that. He only answered the first question so far. I think he did answer it, and I'll tell you my answer. But, but the first question, you understand the answer to? Why it's not two levels of iron? Why it's two levels of iron? Bottom line is there's two levels because the Abishta wants there to be two levels. So the same thing, now you can extend to the second question. Since he wants it, so his service is because the Ebrister wants it. It's not due to the fact that we're blinded and we don't see a Lakus. The Ebrister wants his service. So from the Ebrister's point of view, there's a service because he wants it, not because it has to be. From our point of view, we see existence and we don't see the divine energy within it. So we call it Ayin of the Yesha Nivra. From the Abish's point of view, the ayin of the Yesha Nivra is my wanting his service. I want to have an uh, existence. I want to have a Shemaim Ba'aretz, Oyer and a Kiyah and so on. So I believe he has answered it. I just wanted to point out, if you understand the answer to the first question, by extension you'll understand it to the second. So in other but words, the Abish sees his service different than we do. He wants existence and that's why it exists. We see his savas because we don't see the godliness in it. But the Abishtad exists because I want it to exist. And it's a second level taka. There's a level of ayin that's beyond existence and there's a level of ayin that's within existence. We relate to existence only due to the tzimtzum. But the Abishtad doesn't need a tzimtzum to create existence. So for him existence is elikus in the form of existence. That's ultimately the answer. That's what he also said in Teir Shalom. Remember, we learned the Teir Shalom. One of the reasons I learned it was to explain this. That the Savas is Elokus, but at the same time, it's his Savas. The Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe said it in different words. He said, he's Iu Tof is Bekula Almin. He contains it all. He defines it all. So it exists, but he's not defined by it. We don't see that not defined by it because we only see the existence. So bottom line is, the goal is that we, human beings, should be able to see existence like God sees existence, only as an extension of godliness. So when a person takes a physical object in this world and does a mitzvah with it, for most of us, we're taking object that exists in our lives, and it truly exists, let's say cloth-lit film, or a piece of food, you make a blessing on it. And your mom, Sheikh you're revealing godliness within it. 
But there's a higher level where this very object that you are making the mitzvah is actually pure elikus that God wanted to manifest through, through a cloth of film or through a piece of bread. We don't see it that way. But the goal is ultimately for us to see it that way, that existence, all it is, is a godly expression. And the chiddush is that even existence that we initially cannot see that godliness, ultimately we see it simply as another form of godliness. But it's not the same, same level of godliness as beyond existence, from our point of view, until we come to understand it that way. Because once we see that all the... I mentioned the Rebbe, for example, at the end of a Fabrengen would eat more mezenas to be able to make a bracha. What does that mean? We make a bracha in order to be able to eat. And the Rebbe is eating in order to make a bracha. And meaning existence is only here to bless God. Imagine living your life in a world where everything about this world, all it is, is a way of expressing godliness. We don't live that way. We live in a way, we live in a world, and we align our lives to God. But we don't see our lives as an extension of godliness. But this is ultimately the ultimate yichud of yichud Eloi, yichud tata is coming to this experience. But as I pointed out many times, you can't reach there without first going through the lower levels. First, you have to look at existence and say, what does God want me to do with this piece of food? What does he want me to do in the morning and the evening? All the mitzvahs. That's Yechud Tata, Bitla Yesh. The next level you come to realize that all of this existence is Botl B'Metzius, and it's Botl B'Metzius Mamish, meaning there's only godliness. And then come to the third level, that is both together, that that very godliness also permeates existence. And that's the ultimate Yechud of the two Yechudim. But you can't reach number three or number two without number one, Yechud Tata. That's why this is a complicated experience and, and, and a real hard work. But that's ultimately what he's leading to say. I hope that was helpful. But from, uh, from Hashem's perspective, even in the lower level, that there is the, the Helem, who, who are the Nevoim? The Nevraim are godly energy that are manifest in the form of Nevraim. What do you mean, who are they? It's godliness in the form of Nevraim. So the Nevraim are... And remember, it's Simpson. Think of Simpson itself. Simpson is God's power to conceal. It's still a Koyach We have a problem with... By us, concealment means the opposite of revelation. By the Ebeshter, concealment is just another form of revelation. He's revealing his power to conceal. That's his expression. Just like a Chacham speaks, and there are times he doesn't speak. His not speaking is another one of his strengths. It's one of Hain Hain Vodaisa. Anyway, I, I tell you, you're going to have to work on this. As much as I say, it's my understanding. Um, you're gonna, it, 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 ultimately, you want to understand it. So what should I tell you? I mean, it's gonna, you have to keep going back and forth and back and forth. You know, and... Uh, which I tell you, I mean. So the Nevoim also godliness, the way that he is covering himself, and Hashem wants that in this level they should reveal, he should become revealed to them. As Correct? he sees it, as the Abishtah sees it, yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. Look, how do you explain in Shariqa Damuna? Himamish speaks about this. He says, right? What would happen? If we saw the Chayas Aliki in every object, we'd cease to exist. That's what he says, right? So basically, then the, then, the, then the meaning existence doesn't really exist. It's just God concealing himself. So then he goes on, and that itself, that he concealed himself, was also a Mitzvah. If you, if you remember the Ashaykh of Amunah, he asked the question, because if that's the case, then nothing really exists. It's just an illusion. No, it's not the case, because the Abish himself created a Mogan. So in truth is existence, that Simpson itself is Nikri Kalim, as he puts it there. He asked the question there. 
L'chein, if that's the case, then it's like the Eir Hashem is Betech Hashemesh, completely bottled. And yet we feel like we're the Eir outside of the Shemesh. She explains the Eir, because of the Tzimtzum, we feel outside of the Shemesh. So the Tzimtzum is part of it. So in other words, from the Abish's point of view, there's no difference. Because the Tzimtzum doesn't conceal anything from him. But from our point of view, he created a reality that would allow us to, to, to feel ourselves as independent, and the Aveda is, and that's a true feeling from our point of view, and the Aveda is to get beyond that and come to realize, no, that's also another expression of godliness. But it's step by step, because you can't jump to Eneid Mulvadeh on this level that he's talking here without first aligning and saying, you know, first, instead of following my Nefesh Abamis, let me eat a piece of food, L'Shem Shemayim. That's not this level yet. That's that you've aligned existence to godliness. It's like Rabbi Hillel would lie down and take a nap before Shabbos. He knew that was the time you do that. The Alter Rebbe automatically fell asleep. His home, it sees when you say, his very body, all it is is a vehicle, like Misa and Pela Odom. All he is is a mouthpiece, a vehicle, the arms and legs of God on earth. That's a whole other level than saying, I'm going to do what Hashem wants me to do. Because then there's a me, and that me is aligned to what God wants. But the level of saying that all I am is an extension of godliness on this earth, 24-7, like he says in Tanya, that's a, very, a much higher level. Now, there's really three levels, Yechud Tato, Yechud law, and the Chibur, and Yechud of both Yechudim, like, like we're learning here. Yeah, it's this is remember this is the conclusion of Ayan Bay's here. We're on page 1475. There's only two more pages. So you can imagine that Ebra Shab is now going to the highest levels of Yichud here. This is like not, this is really ultimate. This is like Lo'asid Love. I'm sorry, Vinigl Kwedavai Viro Kol Basu Yakdov, Kishema. Right? Um uh, the, the level of that the Ta'ina itself, existence itself will cry out, Elokus, Evan Mekir Tizak, that the stone in the wall will cry out. You're talking here with the Gili Ka'ech Apoel Benifel, that existence is only one thing, it's just an expression of godliness. But it exists because that's what the Ebrister wanted. He wanted a Tachtainim. He wanted the second level of, of Ayin for the Yesh Anivra. He wants it. But it's only because he wants it, not because it has its own value. That's the key thing to remember. We think it has value. Your ego, me, you. I exist. I'm an important person. But you know what? I'll go and I'll make sure that even though I exist, I'm going to make sure my existence is aligned with my creator's will. That's also an achievement. But it's a whole other thing saying I exist. I exist because only God wants me to exist. That's all there is. I have no exist, not this existence has no value and no power of its own at all. It's simply God saying, I want Tachtenim. I mean, I'm trying to put it as many words as I can. But you can see it's it's not uh, it's it, it requires plenty of uh, discussion and explanation. I'm not suggesting it's an easy topic. Let me make that very clear. But I'm trying to convey it as best as I can. It's very clear that he's saying that here. That's why, if you remember in Teda Shalom, he said, Siddhar Abba Remember he said, Siddhar Abba Because it exists because God wants it to exist, but it doesn't really exist because all it is is God wanting to exist. So imagine finding out that your whole existence is not an illusion. But its whole being is only because God shows that it should be here. But we don't know that initially. That's what he's going to say, that Simpson conceals that fact. So that, that's why we can live our lives as independent, with independent consciousness. But our job is to overcome the Simpson and transform the Simpson. That was a big theme in volume two, that we should see through the curtain and realize that curtain is only there like a student like a muscle, an example for us to be able to relate to it. 
But the ultimate goal is to realize, no, that Tzimtzum is only a, is, is only a uh, another form of godly expression. He's going to give an example for this from a teacher and a student that makes a little more um, uh, palatable. Rab Shlemit, you getting closer to understanding it? Yes, I didn't want to repeat again. There are still some points that... Yeah, I'm not denying. I'm not. I, as I said, this takes more. It's only the ultimate yich, yichud. Yeah. I have a question, if I may. Um, assuming that you could try to under, get to that level of understanding, the ultimate yichud, that third level of where helama atzmi. I know the Rebbe doesn't use this term right now, but earlier in Iron Base, he used helama atzmi and etzma or. One is a concealment. One is a revelation, and that both of those are really just ex expression. Both are equal expressions of godliness. And uh, so if you can understand that, you see that everything is one, is God, concealment and the non-concealment, the revelation. My question here is, assume you could come to that understanding and even halavai, live a life like that. Are we still, are we still not related to God in this ultimate yuchud as a creator, not as an artist, still as the highest level of understanding his artist, that his art is not only what he did, but what he didn't do or what he concealed. But are, are we ever going to be able to relate to God beyond how he reveals himself, whether it's concealment or revelation, but both aspects of expression, kale diet, dea savaya. Are we ever getting to that level of God above the whole thing? Or is this is, this, I mean, not that there's a low level, there's a, a lifetime you could spend trying to get to this, but um, is that is that the level we're trying getting to still as the all artist in his ultimate essence, or are we giving even higher than that as God beyond being an artist? At the end of the day, it comes a combination of both. In other words, like this. Um, it's actually an example that I heard from Ashpim, from my, actually in the name of my own grand, great grandfather, Rab Gershon Ber Paharder. Gershon Ber Paharder was a big chosel of the Samach Tzedek, of the Sachsidis. The Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, speaks very highly of him. He's a big masculine Chassidus. So he gave an example of uh, what we're talking about from uh, a uh, two people are looking, observing. A piece of art. If the art is a picture of a farm, or a field, I should say, a field. Um, and they're marveling at how wow, what amazing, the details, you know. So one of them said, "This artist must be a tremendous uh, farmer." He must have lived on a field all his life. You know, when you live somewhere, you know every detail and captured it so well. The other person said, no, the opposite. He's such a brilliant artist that even though he never saw a field or never lived on one, we should say, never really, he's not a, he's not a person from the field, but he has that ability. That's why he's such a good artist. He can create something that he has no relationship with. And then came the third level, that both are true. Because he's beyond being, a, he's not a, obviously not a person from the field. He's also not limited by being beyond the field. So he's both together. What, what is the marshal coming to tell us? There's no question from our point of view, we first relate to God as artists of the art of this world, which means your life, my life, our families. And the first step is to align ourselves to what the artist wants of us, the creator. That's like mamalakalam. You want to call it Yehuda Tata. The next thing you come to realize, we learned this also earlier in Ayim Beis of Ayim 3. Then what do you mean? God is not defined by being an artist. That's just a little minuscule part of him that he has the capacity also to create art. 
But he's not defined by, first of all, by one limited art. He can create infinite types of art, like we've discussed many times. And more than that, he's not defined by being an artist. He has many other qualities, and art, that being an artist is just one of infinite. So he's completely beyond, like, yes, he created the art, but he's not defined by the art. So that's like Yechudi Law. Then comes a third level. That he's not defined by not being defined either. And he's beyond both. Because he's, the Ed Atmos is not the art, not the artist, and he's not not artist. So because of that, like he says here, two levels of Ayin can emerge from there. Because both of them are equally distant. And therefore, he's both the best artist possible, but he's not defined by being that artist. But he's also not limited by not being an artist, so that's why he creates a world with such fine detail. In other words, like saying, is God wise? Is God loving? So initially we said, if we are loving, and, you know, if God created an eye, does he not see? Of course he sees. So if we have chesed, he also has chesed. But then you come to realize, one second, God is not defined by chesed. He's beyond chesed. And then you come to realize a third level that he's so beyond chesed that he could be chesed and not chesed at the same time, and they're both equal. And therefore, his manifesting in chesed is not a limitation. It's just another form of expression of kayach atzmus. The yecholte lahoyer, yecholte shalei lahoyer, the capacity chesed, the capacity... So it begins with first seeing chesed as a defined entity, then seeing being beyond the defined, and then being beyond beyond the defined, so it goes together with chesed and non-chesed together. So what we say is that God is, you would say, is he an artist at the end of the day? You would say he's a not, not artist. That's what you would say. You wouldn't say he's not an artist, because that's only level two. You'd say he's not, not an artist. Does he have chachem? Chachem v'leib chachem yediyeh. He has chachem, but not like our chachem. So basically you're saying, he, he cannot say, you don't say he's not a chachem, you say he's not, not a chachem. Because you cannot limit him as well and say he doesn't have it. You just can't define him by that. That's somewhat the way, you know, like he says in Samach Vav, he says the expression, it's shlilas kol ha-terim, shlilas ha-chiyu v'shlilas ha-shlila. He negates the positive definition, and he also negates saying that he's not that. So he's not not that, basically. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I advise going over this as many times as you need to. Try to explain it to someone else, and you'll see how uh, uh, frustrated you're going to become. <laughs> but that'll help you get there, because the frustration is necessary here to get to really. Uh, let's go this way: to internalize this, you're going to need to really be over uh, frustrated. Because you need to get out of it's this requires really thinking out of the usual parameters that we're not used to going there. Because what does definition mean? You know, the very definition of definition is in question here. What is a definition? What does a term mean? What are parameters? You know, we're so used to definitions, so we understand okay, there's defined things, and then there are things that are bleakful, they're not defined. But he is speaking about definition because God wants definition, not because he's defined, because he wants to create definition. So it's a whole different way of looking at, at Hagbalah. However, we have, we, have to, we have to begin somewhere, and we are fundamentally finite creatures with parameters. So how does a finite mind come to grasp not only the infinite, but that which is beyond infinite and finite, and a finite that comes from a place that's beyond anything that's limited, that chose to create this limit, chose to create this parameter. 
That's why if you go back to that Sikh and Teva Shalom that we learned, he said, mitzvah misyaksis al atmos. If you remember, we learned that a mitzvah begins, the way we see a mitzvah is, a mitzvah, every mitzvah has a shear, right? Shabbos begins at a certain time, ends at a certain time. A shear, making kiddush on wine. There's an amount of wine you have to put into the cup. A blessing has a beginning and an end, right words. And, it, and you must do it that way. If you don't do it by the shear, some mitzvahs are not being done properly. How much matzah to eat? You know, everything has a shear. Shear achila, a kazayis, when you can make a bracha, and so on. And so we are, so the mitzvahs there are completely defined by, by structures, by parameters. Then you come to learn, one second, God is not is beyond parameters. But he chose, he wanted to confine his, inf, his beyond infinite energy into this building, like we spoke about the Beis Hamikdash. So the Beis Hamikdash says, "Shlema Melech says to Hashem, 'Hashemayim v'Ushmei Hashemayim lo yichal kolucha, Avki Abayis Hazeh, Heavens and Heaven of Heavens cannot contain you. Now this bias, this small little structure called the Beis Hamikdash can contain you. Shachanti b'Seichon, Beis Shnei Bade Aron, where God is so called contained." So, the, so Hashem says to Shleim, yeah, read that bin Not as a question, as a statement. That's exactly right. Heavens and heavens of heavens can't contain me, but I want to be contained in this. So Chassidus gives examples for it. There's the example that Rebbe brings in the Basilagani this year, Manindalach, where, you know, that, that when the, the Gemara brings, uh, asked a question about this, the Medrash asked a question. So it says, it's like Maris Gdelis and Maris Ketanis. So if you could have a king or a person looks into a small mirror and you see a small image of yourself. You look in a big mirror, you see a big image. If you looked into a, a, a much bigger mirror, you'd see even a bigger image, which is you. The answer is the person could be bleak wool, but based on the way he wants to express himself, here he's expressing himself through a small mirror, here through a larger mirror. Like we say about sun, the sun can be the same sun, can be reflected in the Pacific Ocean, and like in a drop of water in your hand. The whole sun. Now, which one is it? Is the sun fitting into a drop, or is it fitting into the Pacific Ocean, or is it beyond both? These are all examples to help someone understand how something beyond, beyond can choose to manifest, and it's not a limit for him. It's what he wants. Like he said here, it's amshachas. Amshachem ain't said baruch. It's not like the lower level came from the higher level. They both initially come. That's what Hashem wants. He wants these two dimensions. In the volume one, he spoke about how the Eir HaBligvul creates bitl in existence. The Eir HaBligvul creates definition in existence. But from God's point of view, he wants both. He wants a defined existence that would be bottle. So the Eir HaBligvul is coming to remind us of God's infinity that is, makes everything nullified in its presence. The divine that relates to existence is just divine in order to give existence definition. But from his point of view, both are the kavana. <clears throat> I mean, sometimes I give an example for this that, that really works, I think, well on a very human level. You know, you, you ask yourself, think of a magical moment in your life. You know, a moment that you'll never forget. A moment a person got married, a person had a, a baby, a child, a grandchild, you know, a moment maybe you met the Rebbe, whatever those moments that become forever, etched. Now, it's only one moment that it happened. It happened a certain second and a certain minute and a certain hour and a certain day. And yet, that minute is, is really infinite. I mean, I don't want to I quote William Blake. It's like holding infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. In other words, you can have a finite ent experience, a finite entity that has an infinite power to it that will never be forgotten. And you can document it and it can live on forever. You know, Chaya Sara, she lived almost 3,800 years ago, yet we talk about her. She's alive today. Same thing, Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov. Why? Because what you have is, it's not the, it, they're not defined by the finite. The finite is where they manifest it. But what's manifesting is something that's beyond infinite, beyond limits. I mean, just as an example to understand how you how it's not a contradiction. So it's not the fact is that the fact that it has parameters does not necessarily mean it's finite. 
It just means it chose to manifest in a in a in a finite uh, experience. Again, trying to just find exp ex examples to capture this idea of time beyond time, space and beyond space, and then beyond both, so they can join together. That's really many ways. Yeah, I was just reading a very powerful sikha, Boy Tovshin Lamed Vov, um, which is the Shabbos, uh, it was right, the Shabbos before Yutzvat, I think it was that year. So the Rebbe quotes, he talks about that there are times that you have to imagine how it was the first time. He's talking about Yutzvat, to go back in time to remember what it was like in Tovshin Yud. When it, for the first time it happened. He's talking here in the positive way, not in the negative, but the positive. He says that. And he quotes the Friedrich Rebbe Sikha, which I was just reading on Shabbos about, the, about this. With, it's a whole story with Rebbe Levi. It's, it's a fascinating Sikha. If you have the Kutte de Burim, I definitely recommend, check out this Sikha. It's a Sikha from um, Shavuos, I believe, Tafre Sadik Dalit. That would be 1934. It's printed in Lekutte de Burim, volume 1, page 331. And if you have Sefer HaSichis, this Sefer HaSichis, which recently came out, it's a new volume. Um, Tafre Sadi Gimel Beis Sadis, it's page 415. Worthwhile reading. Unbelievable piece. He talks about the power of a Chush HaSir to imagine that at times you have to go back in time and realize that there are things that happened to you many years ago that really live on if you allow it to, to go beyond time and space. And he, he gives the example of a, of a whole story with a guy, a, a Jew that wandered off. But bottom line is he was once a soldier in the king's army and he had met the king. And it's years passed since it happened, but he imagines what it was like when he first met the king. And he literally faints, even though it's years later. Because it brought him back to that same feeling, what it was like. That's the example the Rebbe brings that, that a person at times has to. And so the Friedrich Rebbe says, this can be a tremendous power in Aveda that when a person is in a difficult situation, they should bring themselves to a point like that. He brings here, it's a Targut Vedzangut. It speaks about that there are times that a person has to do that. And it's a way of really lifting yourself up, even when someone's in the doldrums like in a very dark place, by being able to imagine something is, um, he says, so that Michal said like this, whenever it's difficult for me, I remember where I stood before the Tzamech Tzedek and he told me, and that brought me back to that place. The power of imagination, the power of, um, uh, it's, it's Chushat Siyur is the expression, the power of envisioning something so I think it's a good, it's a very in Aveda, it's a very good example of of taking the time and space you're in and allowing yourself to go to a whole other place that's beyond time and space. It's things that happened in the past and so on. Yeah. Anyway. I think we should stop here. Um, top of page 1475. I will do the Tsimsum tomorrow. We'll deal with the Tsimsum tomorrow more. Yeah. I'm sure you recall us, us talking about this topic before. Because I remember it, became, it was lively when we talked about it last time too. It uh, definitely brings up all the Challenging. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so on top of 1475 in Ayin Beis, which I said corresponds to, yeah, this is already an explanation of the Mittler Rebbe. It's not really paralleling. He's adding a whole piece. <clears throat> 